So in this component, we're going to be talking about counterfactuals. Because as I said in the last component, Nozick's theory is going to be stated in terms of counterfactuals. So obviously it's going to be important for us to understand what those are. So we're first going to see how we identify counterfactuals. And then I'm going to give you a theory of what they mean. Um, this is going to be helpful for us to unpack the predictions of Nozick's theory uh, later on. So rather than define what a counterfactual is, I think it's most helpful to just look at some examples and get a grip on them that way. So let's consider two examples which I helpfully prepared earlier. One is the claim that if I hadn't set my alarm, I would have slept through class. The other is the claim that if I'd studied harder, I would have gotten a better grade. We can tell that these are counterfactuals because of the kind of language in them. They use the claim the, in the beginning, they say things like I had or hadn't. And in the consequent, they use this language of would or would not. So the had, would combination, that's the mark of a counterfactual. In particular, the had um, or were to features in what we'll call the antecedent. So this bit here, this is the antecedent. And the would features in what we'll call the consequent. So these are just two examples of counterfactuals. Um, they're the main kinds of counterfactuals we're going to think about today. I'll just say that there is another kind of counterfactual called a might counterfactual. An example of this would be a claim like, if I were to flip a coin, it might land heads. That's an example of a might counterfactual because it has a, it has a might in the consequent. We're not going to think too much about those today, but it's good for you to know that they exist. Before I go on, it's worth mentioning that counterfactuals are interesting to people in a range of different areas of philosophy. Now, naturally, in philosophy of language, which we're, which is what our focus this semester is, they're interesting because it's just, it just turns out to be difficult to unpack what claims like this actually mean. But they actually turn out to be potentially theoretically useful in a range of different areas. Um, and at a certain period of philosophy, counterfactual analyses of various phenomena were quite in vogue. So to give just one example, think about what it means to do something freely. So I maybe give to charity every year, and I, it seems like I do so freely. I'm not being forced to do so. But what does it mean to say that I do so freely, that, I, that I'm not being forced to do so? Well, one natural idea tries to explain this using counterfactuals. We might say, well, the reason why I give freely is that it's true of me that had I decided not to, if I had I chosen to do something else instead, then I would have just done that something else. Um, to be free, to do something freely, is just if you had chosen not to do it, you wouldn't have done it. So that's a counterfactual analysis of free action. There are also counterfactual analyses of notions like causation. So when I strike the billiard ball with my cue, that causes it to move. Um, but what does it mean to say that my striking the ball caused it to move? Well, again, a natural idea is to spell this out using counterfactuals. We might say that event A caused event B, just in case had A not happened, B wouldn't have happened. So in our example of the pool cue or the billiard cue, my striking it caused the ball to move because had I not struck it, the ball would not have moved. So that is a simple counterfactual analysis of causation. Um, now I say counterfactual analyses were in vogue because the kinds of accounts I've just mentioned face a lot of different problems. Um, and indeed, Nozick's theory, which we're going to look at, which is also a counterfactual theory, is also going to face problems. But this illustrates that counterfactuals are this important theoretical notion that is relevant to a range of different areas of philosopher, philosophy. It's not just something that interests philosophers of language, even if that is our focus today. Okay, so we've seen something about how to identify counterfactual claims. We look at the language, we look and see, do they talk about woulds or haves or wers? Those are the kinds of things that tell us we're dealing with a counterfactual. So now that we know how to identify them, we need to think about, well, what do these claims mean? 
So if I take a claim like, if I hadn't set my alarm, I would have stepped through class. What, do I, what am I saying about the world when I say something like that's true? To work out what I do mean, I think it's going to be helpful to think about what we do not mean, what these claims do not say. Because one thing they do not necessarily say is that the antecedent entails the consequent. If I say, I, if I hadn't set my alarm, I would have slept through class, I'm not necessarily saying not setting my alarm entails sleeping through class. Because I could nonetheless imagine some possible worlds where this holds, um, but this doesn't. So imagine a world where I just, you know, I never need to sleep. Um, I just don't sleep at all. That could be a world where I don't set my alarm. In fact, I don't even have an alarm. And yet I go to class because I don't need to sleep, so there's no danger uh, of sleeping through class. Nonetheless, the existence of a possible world like that doesn't in any way seem to undermine what I might say using this counterfactual claim. So it's, that shows that it, we can't just mean entailment. We can't just be saying that any possible world where I set my alarm uh, is one... Sorry, any possible world where I don't set my alarm um, is one where I sleep through class. Because this claim can be, can be true, um, even though there are possible worlds that that doesn't hold of. Rather, what we seem to be saying is we're making some claim of a more restricted class of worlds. A more restricted class of worlds where I don't set my alarm. And one way to think about it is we're looking for the worlds that make it true that I don't set my alarm, but nonetheless make the smallest amount of changes in order to make that happen. Um, another way of putting it is we're looking to the most similar worlds where I hadn't set my alarm and seeing whether the consequent is true there or not. We're going to mostly leave this idea of similarity at an intuitive level, so we're not going to give necessary and sufficient conditions for one world to be more similar to another. That's a really important project, whether it can be done, it's seeing whether it's, a, it's, a, it's an important project, um, and a lot of ink has been spilled over it. We're going to just leave it at an intuitive level today, but we will look at it in more detail, use an example, to make sure we really have a grip on it. So let's start drawing another picture um, with three different possible worlds. So we're going to start with what we imagine is actually true. So we're going to imagine that, as a matter of fact, I did set my alarm. And, and it woke me up as usual and I made it to class. Um, but we're also going to be clear about some background facts that hold of me. One is that we'll imagine that I'm the kind of person who will just sleep till noon unless I'm woken up. Um, so I will just say sleeps indefinitely. That's a kind of important background fact that's true of me. But we'll also suppose that I'm very responsive to my alarm. So maybe I have a very shrill alarm. You can fill that in in your heads however you wish. So let's imagine that those are the actual facts. That I've set my alarm, it woke me up, and I went to class. I'm the kind of person who sleeps indefinitely, but I, I am responsive to my alarm. And we're going to think now about two other possible worlds. We'll just call them creatively world one, world two. And they're both going to be worlds where I don't set my alarm. But different things are going to follow from that. So I don't set my alarm in world one. And as a result, we'll imagine that I just sleep through glass. So that's world one. World two is a little different, though. It is one where I fail to set my alarm. But we'll imagine that in this world, for some reason, I just sort of sit bolt right up awake at 8 a.m. And again, fill in the explanation for that however you like. So I'm bolt awake at 8 a.m. And for that reason, I attend class. Because I'm awake, so I might as well go. Okay, so here we have three possible worlds. We have the actual world. We have world one, where I don't set my alarm, and so I sleep through class. Another world, world two, where I don't set my alarm. But nonetheless, I, for some reason, sit bolt awake in my bed at 8 a.m. And then I'm able to attend class. 
So what I want you to observe is that there seems to be some sense, some relevant sense in which world one is more similar to the actual world than world two. And the reason for this seems to be that world one, even though it differs with respect, even though they disagree about whether I set my alarm, it seems to respect the important background facts in world one in a way that world two doesn't. So it seems like here, since I don't set my alarm, I sleep through class. Because remember, that's the kind of person I am. I just sleep till noon if I'm let. This world respects or agrees with world one about not setting the alarm. But it seems to disagree with both world one and the actual world about the background facts. Because here... I sit bolt awake at 8 a.m. and that's not the kind of thing I would normally do given I'm the kind of person who sleeps till, till noon. So even though these are both worlds that are different from the actual world, there seems to be some relevant sense in which if you're just looking for a world that changes the facts about alarm setting, this, fact, this world changes more facts than are necessary and this world seems to preserve more of the facts. So we could sort of picture it that's the three worlds going out there that way, and the worlds are getting sort of less and less similar to the actual worlds as we go that way. Now again, notice that this isn't a de we're not giving a definition of what it takes for one world to be closer than another, but the point is that by looking at examples like these, we can get a grip on what, um, on what the notion is. We have a better sense of what it takes for one world to be more similar to the actual world than another one. And now that we have that, we can then state the theory of counterfactuals that we're going to be holding in the background, which again I've helpfully written in advance. And the theory is pretty simple. It says that the counterfactual, if P had been true, Q would have been true, that holds just in case the most similar P worlds are Q worlds. So that's what it takes for a counterfactual to be true. If you want the if you want to figure out is the counterfactual if it had been the p it would have been the q true, you look for the most similar worlds where p is true, and you determine whether q is true there. And on that methodology, if we imagine that this is something like a complete picture, we can see that this is a picture that makes true the counterfactual that we started with. Because to see if the counterfactual is true, we find the most similar worlds where I didn't set the alarm. To do that, we can forget about world two because it's less similar than this one. On this picture, it looks like this is the most similar world where I didn't set the alarm. So check, is the consequent true there? Is it true that I would have, is it, is it true that I slept through class? And indeed it is true. So this is a picture where the counterfactual is true. I want to do one more example with you just to make sure we've really got this down. So let's erase all this. Let's take the second example of the counterfactual claim for, that we had from the beginning. So the claim was, um, if I had studied harder, I would have gotten a better grade. Okay, so we'll draw another picture of how the worlds might be and we'll just check to see on that picture is the counterfactual true. So let's suppose we'll start again with the actual world. Um, and let's suppose that the exam is really, really difficult. So it's a very difficult exam. And let's say that I studied, let's say, um, on 99 out of the possible days I could have studied out of. Um, but I nonetheless didn't do very well. Let's say, let's say I got an F. So let's imagine that this is the rather depressing actual world that I'm in. And again, 
We'll compare it to two other worlds. In world one, we're going to assume it's still a very difficult exam. And let's say I studied the full 100 out of 100 days. I studied every day. And I still got an F. That's world one. And we'll just draw one more world. So let's see. Imagine that here the exam is very easy. Uh, and we'll say I study every day. And I got an A. So let's first start thinking about, well, on this intuitive notion of being more or less similar, which are the most which are the most similar worlds to the actual world? Is this one more similar? Or is this one more similar? And on one way of thinking about it, it looks like, again, world one is going to be the more similar world. Because there's this important background fact, which is that the exam is very difficult. So even though I there is a difference about how much I study, so I do study a bit harder in world one, it holds fixed the background fact that the exam is still very difficult, and for that reason I still get an F. World 2, all like World 1, is one where I study more than I actually do, but it also changes this important background fact about the exam. In World 2, the exam is easy instead of hard, and for that reason I get an A. So again, it looks like World 2 is sort of changing more about the actual world than it needs to, to, if we're looking for a world uh, where I study more than I actually do. So again, it looks like the picture is that going this way, the worlds are getting less and less similar to the actual world. Okay. So that's our picture of how the worlds are. Now we want to determine, is the counterfactual true or not? Is, it, is this a picture where if I'd studied harder, I would have gotten a better grade? And it looks like the answer in here is no. Because remember, what is the recipe? We find the most similar worlds where the antecedent is true, and we check is the consequent true. Now remember, I actually studied 99 days out of 100. The closest world where I study harder, it's not W2, even though I do study harder, I study every day. It's W1, because even the, while I study every day in W1, the background facts about the difficulty of the exam are held fixed. So W1 is the most similar world where I study every day. And notice here, the result in my result in the exam is exactly the same as it is in the actual world. Because the exam is so difficult, the, the one extra day of study is, doesn't make any difference, I still get exactly the same grade. And for this reason, the counterfactual is false. Okay. So what we've done in this... Um, component is we introduce the notion of a counterfactual. We now have some sense of how to recognize them. Uh, we talked a little bit about their applications in other areas of philosophy. And then finally, we introduced this similarity theory of counterfactuals. We didn't give a definition of what similarity went, means. We left it at an intuitive level. But we saw that on this theory, uh, a counterfactual, counterfactual of the form, if it had been that P, it would have been that Q, is true just in case the most similar P worlds are key worlds.